välkomna. Det här är Veckomagasinets special. Vi befinner oss på Nobelmuseet där vi har fått exklusiva intervjuer med årets mottagare av Sveriges Riksbankspris i ekonomisk vetenskap till Alfred Nobels minne. Och jag får träffa alla tre pristagare och vi ska reda ut eller försöka reda ut varför de tycker så olika och även höra lite hur de ser på den svenska bostadsmarknaden. Welcome to Sweden, Professor Farmer, Thank and congratulations. Thank you. So I read that one of your heroes, Friedrich Hayek, has said that the Nobel Prize confers on an individual an authority which in economics no man ought to possess. <laughs> do you agree with that? Um, yes. You do? Okay. Yes. Well, Why? I mean, people treat you as if you know things that you don't know. Uh, so a month ago, People wouldn't have dreamed of asking me questions that they started asking me yeah. after I won the prize. And I didn't change, so... <laughs> so you think, the, you think the prize is wrong? I don't think the prize is wrong. I just think that people's, people don't understand that you got the prize for a specific kind of research. And suddenly not you, that become, you become the world authority on, on everything. On everything. Right. <laughs> So you coined the term efficient markets and yes. market efficiency in 1965. Right? Yes, right, in the paper. Right. Any regrets? No, no, not at all. No? No. Why? Well, that's a, a concept that uh, generated a, a mountain of empirical work. We understand wh whatever side you take on, on the issues, all the work that was done to test that hypothesis uh, enlightened us about how markets actually perform and work. Uh, so. I don't think there's any question that we know a lot more about markets because of all the work that was done to test that mm. proposition. And you've tested it and you've found some contradictions in the way that markets work as well. Not a lot. Not no. a lot, no. no. But some people, like for example Professor Schiller, pay a lot more attention to those contradictions than you do, right? Well, the way I would say it is, we agree on the evidence, we disagree on the interpretation. Mm. So what he interprets as market inefficiency I'm not so convinced that it really is. Mm. So it's a disagreement about how to interpret the, uh, the actual evidence. Because so, there's a lot of attention around this, you know, are markets rational or irrational uh, in relation to this, this Nobel Prize. But does economics need a theory about human behavior? Do we need to know to do good economic science or research? Do we need to know if human beings well, are rational or irrational? Hmm. We have to talk one human being at a time. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> some are, some aren't, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but e economics is about behavior. Mm. It, it, supply and demand is about behavior, and all of economics comes mm. down to supply and demand. So uh, the fact that behavior gets introduced into economics is nothing new for economics, I don't think. Mm. <clears throat> but what uh, the new behavioral stuff says is there's lots of irrational behavior uh, out there, and then the disagreement comes in terms of how does that affect markets. Mm. Uh, so that's the kind of the focus point of the mm. of the arguments to the extent that there are arguments. So in the, in the current debate, there's lots of talk about asset, asset bubbles and housing right, bubbles, right. and you don't agree with that they exist, or you? <laughs> right. Uh, Tell I, me about that. Well, the. Uh, I don't know of any systematic ever. So it depends on how you define the word bubble yeah? to begin okay. with. The, the way I think people use the word, uh, there, there are lots of different interpretations in economics of that word. So, but I think the way people interpret it is they think, they interpret a bubble as a, a long price increase that implies a predictable decline. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at all the evidence, and other people have looked at all the evidence. There's no evidence that there are predictable. Mm. Uh, declines. So when people say there are bubbles, what I say is that's a religious opinion. Okay. It's, it's not in the data. So if they're not bubbles, what are they? They're just up, they're just up and down up movements, and down of, movements prices of prices that are interpreted after the fact as, as bubbles, but they were never predictable. Mm. Uh, so. But did we, these bubbles, or not bubbles, or whatever we call them, did we, did we underestimate the consequences they could have on the, on the macroeconomy? Oh, I don't, well, we probably did in the sense that we hadn't seen uh, a recession that, like the recession that occurred in 
2008, since 1930. I'm not a macroeconomist, so, but I think macroeconomists in general thought that that kind of thing uh, wouldn't happen anymore because they knew so much about the economy now that it was all under control. So what they learned is they don't, they don't have it all under control. Mm. And you can get hit with a big uh, recession. But that period says nothing about market efficiency because the market, mar markets responded perfectly efficiently to those things. In my view, a big recession comes, markets go down. That's what they do. What That's the, what they're supposed to do. What does the market need to do to be considered inefficient in your Well, so if theory. there were predictable declines mm -hmm. um, after pr long price increases, then I'd be st I, that would open my, my eyes to it. But I'm, a, I'm an evidence person. I'm not a, at least when it comes to economics, if I don't know based on the evidence, I say I don't know. Uh, so, or if I express an opinion, I want to earmark it as an, as an opinion and not something that's based on evidence. So did you learn anything from the current financial crisis? Uh, yes, what we learned is, has really nothing to do with uh, markets, it's having to do with how, what we have to do to make sure that uh, we can avoid what I think is the biggest problem that came out of the financial crisis, which is that the big banks had to be bailed out <coughs> by taxpayers. Mm. And I'm a libertarian. So you don't think they should have been bailed out? Well, I just, it, it's irrelevant because any time it happens, they are going to be bailed out. Yeah. Um, so it's really irrelevant what you think about it. So it doesn't matter which political party is in there at the time. Mm. When you get a crisis, they're going to get bailed out. Mm. So what you have to do is to make sure that you don't have to bail them out. I see. Um, and what that means is you have to make sure that they're not as risky as they were going into this. So you're in libertarian arguing for financial regulation right now? Uh, in this respect, yes, yeah. because um, if the end result is going to be that the taxpayers have to pay, mm -hmm. that's a perversion of capitalism. That's mm -hmm. the worst possible outcome you can, you can think of because it gives people an incentive to take risks uh, because they have what we call a put option, which in simple terms means they get the upside, we get the downside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and who wouldn't want to have that kind of uh, option? So I think you have to take that out of their hands. If you were willing to let them fail under any circumstances, mm. you wouldn't have to do that. Mm. But nobody's willing to do that because mm. it, they perceive that it's too disruptive. Yeah, and no may room. well be. And it's really irrelevant because there's nobody's no going to let it There's no room for ideology happen. in a financial right. crisis, right? right? So I think that the <clears throat> response to all of that has to be that they're required to hold much more equity capital mm. than they were in the past. Um, that's the big message that I think came out of that uh, experience is that... Um, all the all extensive regulation, Dodd-Frank in the U.S., um, and the European banks are going through, mm. you know, Basel, whatever it is, I don't know the number at this point. Three. <laughs> Three, <laughs> okay. That um, they're trying to determine what the level of capital should be. Mm. Um, and I would say they're probably, whatever the number they take, I'd say add 10% to it. You say add 10%. To be sure, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's, that's an interesting point of view. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, sure, my pleasure. Welcome to Stockholm, Professor Schiller, and um, congratulations. Thank you, my pleasure. What is behavioral finance and why do we need it? Well, the word behavioral refers to human behavior mm. as described by social sciences generally. We have many social, we have, beyond economics, we have psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science, we could add history as a social science. These are all different perspectives. Recently, I think that a good number of academics in economics have thought that we need the perspective of these other disciplines. Or I should add neuroscience. Mm -hmm. uh, we're learning a lot about human nature. And that has to affect economics and finance. Otherwise, we're not keeping up with the greater enlightenment that is now possible. Mm. 
But this is a bit controversial, isn't it, to just say that economics is one of all these many social sciences, because sciences, often economics is portrayed as higher in some sense and more scientific and more rigorous. Isn't that right? Economists think that it's yeah. higher and more rigorous. Yeah. One of the funny things about, I think that universities have become more compartmentalized mm -hmm. over the last century or century and a half. They're divided up into schools and departments. And uh, I think that that's a good thing overall because it allows for more effective research that gets to the mm. frontier. But the problem is that if people aren't generalists, at least in some measure, they can become idiots of a sort. Mm -hmm. I, I, maybe that's too strong a word, <laughs> but that people want to be on cutting edge frontier mm. research. And so they don't have time to think about anything else. Mm. They get focused in on one specialty. Now, I think that works better for the physical sciences mm -hmm. than for mm -hmm. economics. Uh, it, can, it can and does work for economics as well. Mm. But I think that there's a lot of progress can be made by bringing the different perspectives back together. Mm -hmm. And that has inspired me, mm -hmm. thinking that I'm not going to play the game of pushing to the frontier and ignoring everything else that's going on. Mm. Lots have been made about the differences between your outlook and Professor Farmer's uh, outlook. So he is emphasizing rationality and you, your work is more emphasizing foolishness. Yeah. Is, is that what it is, that you're emphasizing different things or do you really disagree? Well, I like to say that Jean Fama and I agree on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have great respect for him and his research. Mm. I trust it. I, mm. in, I, I think it's all very well done. Mm. And I read it and I use his methods. Mm. So uh, there are differences uh, that uh, I don't fully un understand. I, I sometimes don't understand why he interprets things mm. as he does. Mm. Uh, but I guess that's what makes for tension that, uh, that ultimately may result in more creative research. Mm. I'm married to a psychologist, by the way. Yes. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I may have acquired habits of thought mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it seems to me that people just aren't rational. I mean, what could be more obvious? Mm. Uh, no, I agree <laughs> with you. But <laughs> well, I, I, uh, people often have conceits. Mm. Uh, they pretend to be rational. Mm. I have to tell you, I'm not rational. <laughs> I have to admit that right up front, uh, and I don't have a view of the world that it's mm. going to be dominated by mm. rational decision making. So why is this theory of rationality or idea about rationality so seductive to us? Because it seems to be quite seductive. Yeah, I think we build. Uh, I'm talking like a psychologist here. We build a self-image. Mm. We have a personal identity. Mm. Uh, we tend to develop an illusion of control mm -hmm. and a sense of rationality that mm. everything I do uh, has a rational reason. Mm. People tend to proselytize their religion. Mm. It seems so logical. My particular sect is obviously right. Mm. I, uh, they, they, maybe people feel some hesitation from doing that, a little bit of reality. But there's in, inside us, yeah, there's an impulse to think that I am... I am just so smart. So you're saying uh, that economics is a religion? Well, I think it, yeah, economics can be a religion. Mm. And it, it, it's evolved very much in politics, too. That, that's a, a problem that we have in mm. economics uh, that separates us from the physical sciences. Mm. So it may be advantageous for an academic economist to form a connection to a political party. Mm. But political parties have party lines. Mm. And uh, they don't want you to deviate from that. You, mm. you become a liability for them if you say mm. something wrong. Mm. Mm. So that's a problem that economics has. Mm. So you're, you're famous as, or for many things, but one of the things you're famous for is as the predictor of bubbles, you know, the dot-com bubble yeah. and the American housing bubble. Why do you think it's so hard for us? This is sort of touching a bit on the previous questions. Even if we have all the figures and we see, you know, we have the right. models and we see all the prices going up and we see the bubble, why is it so hard for us, policymakers, citizens, ordinary you know, consumers, to realize that this is what's going on and, and act from it? Now, that's a very good question. 
and it's a core question in the modern field of sociology, social psychology, yeah. and other social sciences. But I'm asking you. And so you know, <laughs> but the, the reason why you won't get a good answer from mm. most economists is they never read that mm. stuff. Mm. Or if they do read it, they think this is something I don't need to know. Mm. So they're not capable of articulating it. Mm. But part of the answer to your question goes way back to Emile Durkheim, a great sociologist mm. uh, uh, of the 19th century. Mm. He referred to what he called a collective consciousness, that we talk to each other and we generate a sense of the world through our casual talk, which is shared by everyone in a particular culture. Later, another a French sociologist, sociologist, Maurice Halbwax, wrote about a collective memory. That you were saying, we all know the facts. No, we don't. We don't. We don't know yeah, the facts. Because our memory we is selective. We only know the facts that are current, that people talk about. Mm. And, and as regards the housing bubble, well, there are many bubbles, including in Sweden nowadays. Yeah. Oh, uh, you think it's a housing <coughs> bubble? Interesting, yeah? Well, I, I think so. <laughs> many people uh, think so. Uh, I shouldn't be commenting on your housing bubble, maybe. <laughs> well, it's but, not it's on mine. But, <laughs> but the thing is that uh, when I started working in, in, on housing uh, research 30 years ago, there were no good price indexes. And there was no long historical price series. Mm. So what has housing done as an investment? Mm. Nobody knew, no idea. Can you believe that? There was no country in the world, say 30 or 40 years ago, that had a nice long 100-year price series mm. of home prices. Nobody knew. You might think, what is going on? We have so many distinguished economists and scientists, but they only research in certain directions. Mm. They were, the economists love the stock market. There, there are thousands of papers published on the stock market, but very few about the housing market. Mm. There's a little bit of status. Now, I can't explain this, but if you want to be a high-status economist, you, you study the stock market. Mm. The housing market is for people who don't make it to the top universities mm. or the top pinnacles of academic achievement. That's, I, I can't fathom that, but it's true. Maybe it's changing a bit. So people don't research it because it's not glamorous and exciting enough. And so they don't even know what's going on. Mm. But maybe something has changed now when we have realized, I mean, the the huge effect the housing market can have even on the stock market and well, on the, the economy. Changing. Yeah. It's changing, but uh, it's not altogether to the good because there's so much more awareness of home prices now mm -hmm. than there used to be that that, I think, creates a speculative attitude that generates more bubbles. Uh, you, so, you mean a, an awareness among ordinary citizens? Right. Yeah. So when I visited Brazil mm -hmm. five years ago, I came in, I asked people, I was an economist, I asked them, how are home prices doing in Brazil? And I got a blank answer. I, I don't know. And I said, well, what do the price indices say? And they said, there are no price indices for homes in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So I come back uh, earlier this year to Brazil again. Now what do I hear? Big housing bubble going, or boom, they didn't call it a bubble, going on in the major cities. And then they were showing me this price. Now there's a FIPE ZAP index. And everyone's talking about it. So something changed in just five years in Brazil. And I think it's a cultural change. So uh, economists have to learn to think more like sociologists mm. or social psychologists because what's happening is not understandable just in terms of what the central bank did or what interest rates are. It has something to do with changing culture. And I'm worried about the, the speculative culture that's developing around much of the world now because it may generate more market volatility mm. in the future. So what can policymakers do in regard to housing markets? You say we need more information, but then as your example about Brazil, more information can create more speculation. Yeah, that's right. What can a policymaker do? Well, it's, it's a difficult thing, of course, and that's why we have to think broadly. Policymakers have to uh, try to tap all different sources of information about what's going on and they have to be willing to use their sense of human nature. So you, you mentioned that I pre predicted the stock market peak in 2000 mm -hmm. and the housing market peak in 2006. Partly 
that was my sense of humans and what they're, what they're thinking. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't any high-flown mathematical mm -hmm. model. Uh, it was the sense of, you know, people don't always tell you what they really think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to kind of read between. Mm -hmm. And I had the sense, let's say in 2006, that the housing boom was kind of a sales job that there were lots of people who benefited from the housing boom and they didn't want to rock the boat and they, they were, that they had never really studied things. They didn't, they, they would tell you that this is secure. Uh, and they also had their economists who were, it's like a political party, you know, they have a party line, they're, they're happy to see it go. And there wasn't any incentive for someone to do research and say, no, this isn't right. Uh, uh, or there wasn't a, a, a mechanism to get them heard if they did. So that was my just understanding of our culture and our society about the zeitgeist, mm. that's a German word, spirit of the time. Uh, that, uh, that's why we need policymakers. How who, can you model uh, the zeitgeist? Or should you model the yeah. zeitgeist? Well, I think that there are multiple models, and, and, um, but it also involves human judgment. Mm. It, it's a complex world that we live in. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Welcome to Sweden, Professor Hansen, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much. It's my privilege to be here. So your work has not only been about asset pricing, but a lot about the linkages between asset pricing and the macroeconomy. Yeah. Why is this so important to understand? Yeah, so the, the what I think is what I've been really fascinated with and I think is very important is that um, the interaction between what goes on in financial markets and what to, and and when does financial market turbulence spill over into the macro economy that's when does it have important social consequences to the society at large and vice versa when do things in the macro economy actually get revealed in asset markets so that so to me that connection is critical because I think for me that's why I really care what goes on within financial markets and models of markets in order that I understand that connection much better. And did we, everyone, underestimate this before the financial crisis? The financial crisis has been very interesting in that sense. It certainly did expose, to me at least, and to many others, some gaps in our knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and, Which and gaps? Gaps are, and the gaps have to do with this, you know, linkages between financial markets and the macroeconomy. There was a little bit of feeling among macroeconomists that that the financial markets were basically indicators of the macroeconomy, but the, but that but that perhaps the perhaps that um, issues about financial crises lead, leading into macroeconomic big macroeconomic events was more of a thing of the past, and we certainly have understood now very clearly that it's not, and it's led many people, myself included, to think about how to build better models that uh, pick up on this linkage between the two. How can models help us? Um, so what models are, why I view models as important is that it gives uh, a, a formal framework for thinking about what, is a good what are good and bad policies, what are good p policies that help us manage the macroeconomy, what are good ways to engage in things like financial oversight. In the absence of kind of good models and good scientific foundations, then we're led to lots of regulatory discretion, and that can sometimes lead to kind of arbitrary decisions that are not so productive. The extent that we can connect it back more formally to to kind of models and basic knowledge, then I, I think it helps in order to, for more prudent policy making. But aren't all economic models wrong in some sense? Absolutely. In fact, all models are in some sense wrong by, uh, by the very de definition. The challenge is to get them right in, along the important dimensions. You know, all models have to abstract from something because you know reality is complicated, and we have to. And, and um, so the real challenge, and you know, that's part of what I view my own role in, in this and the role of others, is to figure out what models are good for and what their gaps are, mm. and 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 uh, making sure that you know if the gaps are going to spill over into the policy realm, then we have to worry very much about those are the gaps in which we have to close. And I think what the financial um, what the financial crisis, you know, the company with big macroeconomic events did to us is it says, well, here's here's some important knowledge gaps, and to build models that will help us better in the future, let's let's figure out how to close those gaps. So policymakers in Europe right now are thinking, 
a lot about financial yes, regulation and absolutely. What, what is what would you say is the most important insight from from economics that they need to understand in order to design this new regulation yeah so what i'm i'm particularly concerned about is the following that it is that um and i've heard this described in lots of different settings that this is a complex you know financial market oversight is a complicated problem mm -hmm. and it absolutely is there's no doubt about it but given that our knowledge base is limited complicated problems do not necessarily require uh, the best course of action may not be complicated solutions i think actually simplicity when it comes to setting capital regulations when it comes to um, how those regulations out of uh, um, evolve over time is 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 the best way to go in the short run until our knowledge base gets much more ex, um, expansive and on much firmer grounds so my own view view of this is we should acknowledge the limits to our knowledge and that should show up in terms of designing regulations that are both enforceable that are not excessively complicated and that are transparent yeah, transparent yeah so last question, are you, are you tired of people asking you uh, about if you agree more with Professor Farmer or Professor Schiller? I am oh, tired about that, Yeah, yes. tired of that, yeah. <laughs> yes, I suppose absolutely. you are. So you, the question of, of if markets are rational or irrational, yeah. you don't think that's that important to answer? Or? It's not that it's not that important. I'm keenly interested in the extent to which uh, uh, how markets function. To me, the key question is not the markets themselves, but how it spills over into how we allocate resources mm -hmm. across the economy more broadly. You know, uh, uh, to what extent to the, to what goes on in financial markets does carry over to, to the society at large. So I often feel like the, it's almost like the wrong question being asked here. It's more about um, is uh, what's the role in financial markets in terms of how we really allocate resources and where, you know, where is that, where should there be causes for concern and not. Um, whether it's rational or not. So again, this gets back to the notion of a model. A model's mm -hmm. some simplifying construct. And of course, when economists use rational models, we don't believe that everyone's perfectly rational. I'm not perfectly rational. I, you know, it, it, it's the question is, uh, are those, um, if we're going to replace a rational model by an irrational one, we well, can be irrational in a whole lot of ways. Mm -hmm. so, we have, so we have to talk more specifically about what that means. And at the end of the day, I like models, and I want to look at what models are good for and what their limits are. And I'm willing to be eclectic about the nature of the models. Thank you. Och tack till er för att ni har varit med oss här på Nobelmuseet idag. Hoppas att ni har blivit lite klokare. Jag tror att jag har blivit det och vi ses snart igen.